championship lead of 25 points for Nigel Mansell in the IndyCar series with five races to go. Nigel in peerless form with back-to-back -back victories on ovals. Now for the run-in to the title. Leading the opposition, the 46-year-old veteran Emerson Fittipaldi, determined to add another championship to his impressive collection. But Fittipaldi's teammate, Paul Tracy, has come of age this year. He may look like a studious college boy, but he's tough, a brilliant talent. The reigning Formula One champion, Nigel Mansell, is showing the Indy cars why he is called the Lion. On the Milwaukee Mile, he charged and tore at his competitors, fiercely passing Raul Boisel to take oval win number one. At the Michigan 500, he battled illness and the track to score his first super speedway victory for Newman Haas. Two weeks ago in New Hampshire, he won the fiercest mile fight in memory to edge out Paul Tracy and surge ahead in his quest for an IndyCar championship. Mansell is the lord of the IndyCar domain, but the season is not yet over. Consider the young gun of the circuit, Paul Tracy. Tracy has scored three times this year, every time on a road course. Here last year at Road America, Paul took his first IndyCar pole. Then, trying for a quicker lap yet, found disaster instead. Paul was not injured and was ready to lead the pack toward the first turn on race day. In the early going, he fought with teammate Emerson Fittipaldi and won. It was then that his youth showed through. He pushed too hard. Today, the story is the same. A devastating crash Friday in the poll yesterday. Will he ruin Mansell's championship dream? Or could Emerson Fittipaldi now second in the points? This is Emo's kind of track. In 88, he took his second win here. Last year, his experience on road courses propelled him to the front as he started a streak that nearly gave him the IndyCar title. Can Emo begin a similar challenge here and now? Will the skillful, patient stalking of Fittipaldi trap the lion down? The run for the PPG Cup now continues at Road America. August in Wisconsin, the perfect time to stage a major sporting event in the state. Before the onset of winter, when, they say, the locals move out of their cabins and burrow up for the duration. Wisconsin is hardly the most metropolitan area of the United States, but it does have a fine racetrack, a demanding circuit four miles long, 14 turns with climbs and dip. Nigel arrived at Elkhart Lake almost two weeks after that fine win at New Hampshire, his second in succession on an oval, giving him a 25-point lead in the championship, with the Penske pair Fittipaldi and Tracy both having clocked up a century of points. For Nigel, Elkhart Lake was again uncharted territory. Advantage Penske, Emerson won here last year, and Paul Tracy holds the lap record. Good morning to you, well here we are. We're in Road America, Benanon, Elkhart Lake. The weather is beautiful. The track is just phenomenal. It's over four miles long. It's what I term as a thoroughbred racetrack. Thanks a lot, have some fun out there. Thank you. Got a lot of high speed sections. A lot of corners to get right because we've got a lot of corners which are approaching uh, 200 miles an hour. And uh, the track at different places, not that wide. We've got very, very little wing here. Good luck, so good luck, Nigel. Thank you. We've got a lot of uh, instability in the car. There's a carousel, which is uh, like a corner, really. Uh, a lot of you watching, if you went to uh, the Osterite ring years ago, the last race there. In 86, it's like the Bosch curve and a phenomenal corner, and probably the main section to this, uh, this circuit here. You've got to be very quick coming out of there to slingshot then down a 200 plus mile an hour straight away. As you can see here, there's not many fans here this weekend. How are you doing? You're going to wait to the TV camera here, right? Say hello to England. Thank you very much. Once again, the American public had turned up in their thousands to catch a glimpse, or if they were lucky, to meet the world champion. The IndyCar series gives the fans far greater access to the teams and the drivers, particularly on days of practice and qualifying. This would be a rare sight in a Formula One paddock. 
co-owner of the team, Paul Newman, was unable to make it to Road America on Friday, but just before qualifying commenced, he wished Nigel luck. Hi, Paul. Hey? Yeah, no. <laughs> There's a lot to learn. I've been I've been plowing. I've done some grass cutting and a few things. Yeah, so um, <laughs> the, the 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 car might need a new paint job on the front. <laughs> oh, it's great. It's a super track, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's going well. When are you coming in? Right. Okay. All right, Paul, look forward to it. Take care, huh? Bye. Nigel had his first experience of the four-mile track earlier that morning. The practice session gave him an opportunity to get to know the circuit and the surroundings. Remember, he'd never raced or even tested at Road America before. During this first session, the team tested the radio communication system at every corner of the track. Team manager Jim McGee wanted the best possible signal. One, two, three, four, do you have a copy? A great copy. I'm right behind the pits now, going up the hill underneath the bridge. So, uh, copy you real good, Jim. In that first practice session, Nigel had been impressive. He headed the list with a time of 1 minute 49.683 seconds. That's an average of 131.287 miles an hour. Paul Tracy was second fastest, but then had a big accident in his Penske. Fabulous circuit, over four miles long. We've just uh, completed the first hour and a half session, and uh, I'm very pleased to say that we're just a little bit quicker than the rest of the field. Incredible circuit, very demanding, it's very up and down and uh, yeah, average lap speed is about 135 miles an hour. Paul Tracy had a big off this morning, I haven't heard the result of it, I think he's okay but uh, I think it's uh, totally destroyed the car in one of the fastest sections of the circuit. We're paying very special attention uh, to the setup of the car here. We're very trimmed out, that's to say that we're not carrying much aerodynamic download at all. Um, at this moment in time, I'm um, just quietly optimistic, but very, very challenging course indeed, and uh, Emerson's going quite well. I think a second covers about 10 cars here for a circuit over four miles long. That's very impressive. Um, we've just got to wait and see what happens. Weather conditions, you can see, if you look around, it's a bit threatening, especially over there to the west. Um, I hope it stays uh, dry. I'm certainly um, looking forward to qualifying and uh, getting the first day out of the way. Paul Tracy was limping around the paddock after the crash in practice. He had bruising to both legs. And his right ankle, injured earlier at Long Beach, was especially sore. Well, I think that's, uh, I've been able to combat the pain since I you know, got on top of it right away. I think if I had waited, there would have been a lot of swelling in my ankle. But I was able to look after that right away. And my neck is real sore, and I'm having to use double straps to keep my head in place so my neck doesn't move because it's really sore. But my ankle's got the movement in it but it's sore when I really press hard on the brakes so over a long race I'm gonna have to see how it feels tomorrow. It's gonna be tough to win the championship if Nigel finishes every race but you know it still can be done with the way the points are are uh, put out. I think if we can uh, get a couple more wins and maybe Nigel has some uh, DNFs that will be right there but if Nigel finishes every race it's gonna be very tough and gonna be make for a great finish. Back at Road America after missing several races, ex-Formula One man, Eddie Cheever. This is the best racing in the world. Or probably maybe even the second best. Maybe NASCAR has better, has more exciting racing than, than this does, but this is far and beyond the excitement that you get in Formula One. It's not because the Formula One drivers are not good, they're exceptional. But it's just that it's focused too much on technology and not enough on the driver. What do you think about the uh, the new changes they're trying to introduce, like banning active suspension? And, um... I think it's a great advancement. Formula One is run by one of the best racing people in the history of motor racing, which is Bernie Eccleston. He knows more about racing than many people do. And um, 
he's done a great job bringing Formula One to the point that it has, but I think now it's gone past what it should be. They've got to bring it a little bit back into the driver's hands. I'm not saying that the best drivers are not winning. I'm saying there's too much discrepancy between the best and the ones that are not the best. Do you think it's a lot more competitive here? It has to be. People come. People don't come to see the red car win every time or the white and blue one win every time. They come to see a fight. They come to see. It's, that's why people do the lottery because they don't know who is going to win. And racing should be the same way. I mean, if you're well prepared, you should have a better shot at somebody who's not well prepared at winning the race. But it doesn't mean that you should have a hundred horsepower advantage or your car should be able to turn at 30 miles an hour quicker than anybody else can. Qualifying, and Nigel in confident mood after that impressive run in the morning practice session. Chief mechanic Tom Wirtz, as always on hand with advice and help for the world champion. The Newman Haas team had tested here a few weeks before with Mario Andretti and had gleaned some useful information. Nigel, as his earlier performance showed, liked the circuit and suggested that it could be used as a future Formula One Grand Prix venue with a few safety improvements. Nigel was quickest in first qualifying, almost a second faster than Paul Tracy, who had to run with his spare car after the earlier accident. Of all of America's road circuits, this is the fastest and the most challenging. Look at this flying lap from the champion's view. Pakistan finish line. Flat in fifth gear, you're doing now 190, 195 miles an hour, breaking down the third gear into the right-hander, accelerating as quick as you can, and now you go down the hill up to fourth, breaking from about 170 down to third again, around another right-hander, very slippy around here, accelerating out a little bit slower into fourth, and now just under the bridge, and now into fifth. And now you're getting up with the 200 miles an hour, and you start dropping downhill again, going down and breaking about 300 yards right down the second gear to the left-hand hairpin. Round here, bit of understeer, pushing it out there on the throttle. Third gear, under the bridge, down the second again, keeping it in tight. A lot of understeer here, accelerating third, flicking it round here now, trying to go flat out round here. Now you drop down the hill in fourth gear. Again, approaching this 170, down the second. And now around this corner, very important, accelerating second, third, fourth, and into the carousel. This is like the Bosch curve of the Osterite ring in Austria years ago, incredibly. Flat out now, out of here, and approaching what they call the kink at 180 miles an hour into fifth. And this kink there is almost flat, it's incredible. And now you're getting upwards of 200 miles an hour again, dropping down, coming to a right-hander now that you're taking second gear, braking hard, fourth, third, second. Accelerating out of here, uphill again, underneath the bridge, third, into fourth now, and then just holding it, saying third, into fourth, and now breaking hard again down to third, accelerating around the corner, now you've got to go uphill again, you can see in the distance, you've got to climb the hill. One minute, 48.673, an average speed of 132.5 miles an hour. Nigel went even faster in the second qualifying session, but so did Tracy, and the Canadian put his spare car on the pole. Mario Andretti was third fastest. Taking time out from the Formula One scene during a gap in the schedule was world sports car champion and footwork driver Derek Warwick. Warwick, a veteran of 143 Grand Prix, is now setting his sights on an IndyCar drive for 1994, he was at Road America, exploring all the possibilities for next season. Formula One now has got to a situation where if you're not in the top three or four teams, you're not going to win a race. And, you know, why am I a race driver? You know, I want to win races. And I think that uh, somehow I feel that if you're in a top ten team over here, you can get lucky and win a Grand Prix. And I suppose I've decided that this is where I want to go for, for my future. You know, Nigel has created a lot, lot of interest in throughout Europe, and I think all the Formula One drivers are aware of Indy, um, and it's only just now that, that everybody's starting to come over and, and just see what it's all about. The thing that that, that that comes across to me is you're here in the paddock this weekend, and everybody's smiling. You know, everybody's enjoying it. Everybody's remembered um, why they're here. They're here because they they love their sport. And I think, to a certain extent, we've lost that a little bit in Formula One. We need to get it back into Formula One, and I'm sure, I'm sure we could get it back, but it's, it's not there at the moment, you know, and that's the two differences. 
Derek's one of the most popular of all the Grand Prix stars. There's no doubt he'd fit in well on the Indy circuit. If you look at the front end, like Bobby Rahal and Mario Andretti at 53, God, I hope I'm that good at 53. You know, there's, there's, there's a lot of talent out here. And just because it's America, it doesn't mean to say, you know, that they're, they're, they're all just, you know, IndyCar racers and that's it. And I think what's happened is, you know, Michael has come to England and because of a lot of circumstances, he's not been quick. So there's a lot of people out there that think that IndyCar racing is easy and that we ought to get over there because we're just going to uh, blow everybody away. But the reality of that, I'm afraid, is uh, quite different. You know, everybody always says, you know, what, would, you, would you like someone like Mansell or Senna as your teammate? Well, I would, you know, because am I any good? Who knows, you know, until I'm actually in the team with a, a teammate of that calibre, who knows? So, you know, yes, I jump at the chance. Elkhart Lake makes special demands on the cars, especially in fuel consumption. Thirsty cars don't finish, as Michael Andretti discovered four years ago. Andretti had led for most of the race, but when he ran dry, Danny Sullivan swept through to snatch victory on the very last lap. It cost Andretti at least 13 points and perhaps second place in the championship. For Sullivan, a heartening result in a middling season, only a year after winning the title. So fuel was a prime consideration when Nigel left the pits to line up on the front row alongside Paul Tracy. Team manager Jim McGee issued the instructions. What I'm going to tell you about and show you is the, uh, the fuel adjuster in here. You probably heard us talking in the race, uh, Jim McGee telling me 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock and 12 o'clock on the fuel settings. What we have here is, is the knob for the fuel. That currently is at 9 o'clock. When we have a yellow flag, we put it at 6 o'clock and what it does in fact, it uh, makes the, uh, the mixture leaner and we save fuel and what we try and do is get maximum fuel uh, efficiency on the slow laps. And then obviously for the engine to run really efficient, we put it at 12 o'clock, which is ba basically 100%. The engine's getting 100% fuel. And I can't tell you the percentages, what they are at 9 o'clock and 6 o'clock, but obviously it's a lot leaner. So that's the way we save fuel. The other way of saving fuel is this is the boost knob right here, which is above the fuel knob. And you just turn that anti-clockwise, that reduces boost. But the best way to conserve fuel is come off the power a little bit on the accelerator and, of course, leaning the engine off. The only thing you must remember when you lean the engine off, though, you can lose a little bit of power and you can put the uh, temperatures of the engine up a little bit. So that's what uh, with all the RT is with 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock and so on. Very, very important part of the race. Yeah, our car's been really good on, on fuel consumption. I've, I think uh, one of the reasons I've been, you know, trying to be fairly smooth on the throttle, and, you know, just... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think just trying to limit the wheel spin, that's what, you know, a lot of the turns you get wheel spin off of, and if you can limit that, then you burn a lot less fuel. We had uh, a couple of great runs, and uh, I think we optimized the car to the, the maximum it had, and I'm very happy with my time. Uh, there's no doubt uh, pe the Penske car is good, but I'd, I'd just like to uh, say that uh, Paul did a fantastic job bearing in mind what he went through yesterday. And I congratulate him for it. I think it was a, a marvelous time. I'm just sorry we couldn't compete. But uh, we're happy to be on the front row and uh, no complaints at all. Uh, the car went well. We're also joined with Mario Andretti. Mario uh, came through uh, very strong right at the end to take over third position on the grid. Mario, tell us about how you found conditions out there today. Well, basically, I think uh, quite good. Uh, the track uh, uh, was kept quite clean, and uh, considering the fact that uh, there were some uh, spots of sunshine, I, I was uh, surprised that um, you know that we were going to be able to go that quick. So, all in all, as I said, I I'm fairly happy with my car. Sunday, race day, and another record attendance for the IndyCar World Series. 65,000 fans turned up for round 12 of the championship, beating last year's figure by 15,000. Early morning and the rolling road course looked in fine condition. Road America is North America's finest road course. 
very technical, very demanding. The circuit is well run and attracts the most well-bred racing aficionados in the US. Emerson Fittipaldi and Mario Andretti. Between them, they've been racing for 70 years. And there was huge support again for Nigel as the countdown to the race began. In the morning warm-up, the team worked hard on achieving the best setup on full tanks. Nigel was in pretty esteemed company. Gene Hackman, who part funds the Rick Gallus team, and Paul Newman. One of the Gallus drivers, Danny Sullivan, looked confident. Paul Tracy and the Penske team were in belligerent mood. Tracy had been by far the quickest in the morning warm-up. Emerson Fittipaldi's characteristic smile, but it hides the determination he has shown in the season-long battle for the championship. Minutes to go now, and the crowd were making themselves heard. Ray Halls and the Mansells have become good friends over this year. Nigel wished Bobby good luck in his own special way. So Penske alongside Newman Haas on the front row yet again. Both teams desperate for a win that would go a long way in deciding the destination of the IndyCar World Series title. This is how they lined up on the grid at Road America. After one lap under the yellow flag, the cars lined up for 50 laps and 200 miles of Road America. Commentators for the race are Derek Daly and Paul Page. Freddie Bad. 
Trace against Raul Boisel as Mansell comes in right behind Paul Tracy. And Tracy leads him through the first corner. Now downhill and a tremendous set of elevation changes at this track. Emerson Fittipaldi looking for racing room as he closes in as well. Robbie Gordon actually went outside Emerson in that turn one, but we're inside with Mansell very briefly, right up behind Tracy. Paul Tracy now has to hold off as Nigel Mansell does everything he can under heavy braking, coming down into station five. Mario Andretti ducks inside of Nigel Mansell. They climb the hill, still in the same order. Look at Robbie Gordon. Robbie Gordon is flying on this opening lap. Gordon gets around Alan or Jr. comes up to the top of the hill. The rest of the field comes through safely. Now, Paul Tracy begins to pull away a little bit. Keep an eye on that black car of Robbie Gordon as he lines up behind Raul Boisel. It's Tracy, Mansell, Mario Andretti, Boisel, Robbie Gordon, Alan or Jr. Gordon has gone from eighth place right up behind Raul Boisel here. Gordon made some spectacular moves in that the first few corners here as they head to the high speed side of the back section of the race course. And oh, off drive, he got off and got back on and kept it under control. Now he's in trouble though. Look at Al Jr. has the run on him, but he's going to block him. He's going to block him. Look down the inside. Little Al looks for room to the outside. Can't find it. They go single file through here. Very difficult section of the course. Battle for third now begins to close up as Raul Boisel. Comes up right behind Mario Andretti as they climb the hill, make the left-hand turn at the top. It's a blind corner. Looking for Ford to remedy on Bozell is off the course is Roberto Guerrero. A quick off and back on and as he climbs that hill and makes the left-hand turn into a section of the course they call Hurry Downs. The battle for third once again. There's the telemetry coming out of Raul Boisel's car. The impressive thing here is the speed. This is the carousel to go through. You can see that 115 miles an hour on Accelerate. Now the charge starts. The kink here sometimes is flat. Look, look, he backs off the throttle. You can see it, that bottom bar. Now the run down to Canada Corner where there's a braking zone. Look at this, 195 miles an hour with full fuel load. We were speculating in the morning one lineup when he was uh, running at 191 miles an hour whether or not that wasn't his peak potential speed on full fuel tanks. Obviously, it's not. He's very fast through there. Keep, you can keep looking at the telemetry on this front stretch. Sometimes, depending on how the wind blows, even with this uphill climb here past the pits, this front straight is almost 190 miles an hour sometimes. Let's have a look here. Oh, it's getting close. Here you go again, 192 miles an hour on the front straight, 193 down the back. Paul Tracy that is still leading Nigel Mansell in the Texaco Haviland 200. Emerson Fittipaldi currently runs in eighth place trying to catch up with the rest of the field. Just moments ago, one car off, Adrian Fernandez, dropped a wheel off and caught the barrier very hard and then slid to a stop. That's over on the back side of the course. The yellow flags being displayed all around the course, which means a full course yellow. Gordon Johncock is the driver of the pace car. He will come out on the course. They'll slow the field down. No passing at this moment. And they'll then try and get Adrian Fernandez's car off of the race course and make sure that he's well. Here's the start of the race as we take a look. Look at Paul Tracy as they came past the first corner. He dropped the left rear off and almost got totally sideways. Yeah, that was turn three exiting on to the first of the back straights here. Uh, Tracy used every piece of talent he had to drag that car back on. And Mansell wasn't able to accelerate and get a good run on him because Tracy ducked back on to the racing line again. Tracy almost totally alone as he sees the green flag. Gets a good jump on the rest of the field. He's chased by Mansell. Roberto Guerrero in the red car is not a factor here. He is down a lap to the rest of the field, but the field has to deal with him. Mansell chases him, then Andretti chases Mansell. Now Robbie Gordon has to deal with the somewhat slower car, Roberto Guerrero. A look back from Mansell. Here they come off the corner now. Tracy uses every inch of the race course. The two Newman Haas cars chasing the Penske of Paul Tracy. 
And that's Lion Dyke pulls out a line to get by Guerrero. There's nothing Guerrero can do. He really has to move aside and let those leaders by, but puts himself further and further behind. Look at Robbie Gordon. Robbie Gordon comes in to challenge Andretti while at the same time, Fittipaldi was challenging Lion Dyke. Gordon off the course again. It gives the position back to Andretti. Second time off the course today for Gordon. Now he's right back at Andretti. Experienced and off track racing, so he spends lots of time on the grass and on the dirt, but on Indy cars, you gotta keep that those four black patches on the road but gordon ever spectacular but he just went in too deep under the break look at the look at the uh, the cue behind the rahal goes inside uh, guerrero ari liondag pulls up right behind gordon as does fittipaldi bobby rahal came alongside a slower car appeared to be guerrero so he could get a good run into the carousel in a critical section of the race course there is rahal as he makes that turn into the corner and once again a wheel dropped off here comes gordon running through now that wasn't Gordon that time. That was one of the Newman house cars. Mansell R. Andretti stuck a wheel off the track onto that dirt. Later is still Paul Tracy. He crosses the line as he increases the pace at 132 miles an hour. Fastest lap of the race thus far on the last lap for Paul Tracy. There's Mansell, there's Fitt and Mario. Here's the rest of the group as they come down the hill. And Fittipaldi tries to make a move on Lion Dyke. Van Dyke runs in fifth, Fittipaldi trying to get around him. And remember, for the championship fight, it's Emerson that needs to finish ahead of Mansell. Remember, Tracy is 40-something points behind, so the chances of him catching Mansell are slim. But Emerson is a long way back here. He needs to get closer, and he needs to get ahead of Mansell to increase this championship fight. Tracy comes up the hill, heads for the chicane, and for what should be the first of two stops, Gary Gerald is there. We have the moment that these teams wait so anxiously for. They want to display their skills, their capability. They're ready now. The Penske team for Paul Tracy, here he is perfectly on the mark. The young driver hit it right on the nose. No word about any discomfort in the cockpit. Remember, he's far from 100% physically, but they love the way the car's been working. They like the fuel mileage. Everything is very positive. Mansell is in. Tracy's out in 14 seconds. Let's go to Jan. Nigel Mansell just screams away, Gary. They waited for every last drop of fuel, not one change on Mansell's car. He's away. Mansell, Tracy already out of the pits. Both of them have to be very concerned with the speed limit in the pits. Robbie Gordon is in the pits as well. All the cars theoretically should come in on this stop, save perhaps Bosell because of the splash and go that he got earlier. And you can see Gordon's not happy with the handling of that car. We saw them take front wing out of his car. Obviously it oversteers. That's what slowed him down a little bit. That may be Heladari Lyondike to move ahead, which has now given him the lead very temporarily though. Lyondike stayed out as did Fittipaldi, Raul Boisel, and Mike Groff. So they run first through fourth. But on the next lap, they certainly will have to come in. Well, three of them will. Remember, Bozell made a Bozell stop earlier. Right to the lead. So, although Bozell made a miscue, if this race fell into his hands, if there was another yellow, that actually may have been a good move earlier to come in. So the key question will be, how will Raul Bozell come on in relationship to both Paul Tracy and Nigel Mansell? as the rest of the cars go in for their pit stop. Currently, you're looking at the 10 car. That is Ari Leyendijk, and he is the leader. He can't stay out much longer. He's probably on his way to the pit lane now, having done 18 laps. 16 was the magical lap number before we had that lengthy yellow. What's he gonna do? Through the there. final corner, yes, he comes over to the right and up the pit road, so he will relinquish the lead, as will, we assume, Fittipaldi. There he is. But Raul Boisel stays out, as he should, because he picked up fuel in the early going. And they look so slow and controlled when they do 80 miles an hour coming down this pit lane. They're in together. This is a fight between the two crews. And Paul Tracy comes around both of them. And Tracy picks up the lead of the race, but Raul Boisel may have fallen into a position that puts him into second place. As you ride with Nigel Mansell, he is in third place. 
With that miscue on the pit stop in the early going, Raul Boisel picked up an advantage for this stop. Of course, he'll be out of the pit stop sequence for the remainder of the day now. So Ra Raul Boisel is in second place, and you can see looking ahead from Mansell's car, Boisel is not in sight. He is closer to Tracy than he is to Mansell, and he is beginning now to close on Paul Tracy. Mansell's pit stop was not quick enough. It was not as fast as Tracy's, and just look at the lead now. Tracy has over the third Third place car, Nigel Mansell. We're, we're, we're leaving Bozell out of the scenario because we know he's out of step on these pit stops. But let's go back to his Ford Electronics and look at the telemetry being given to us by Bozell's car. Again, the interesting thing is the speed on the right-hand side and the amount of throttle he uses. You can see him off and he blips as he down changes. As Al Unser Jr. pulls off the edge of the race course. Could that be the same problem that bit Danny Sullivan? No, or? I wouldn't think so, but this is a shame because Al Unser Jr., after he qualified sixth, thought he had the best handling car that he has had all year and really thought he could challenge to try and win this race. Now it's over. And lots of speculation as to what he will do next year. Will he say an IndyCar? Believe it or not, Al Unser Jr. wants a Formula One opportunity, and Bozell is in. So Ryle drops out of second place and heads into the pits. Gary Gerald waits for him. I'm glad you mentioned that second place, Paul. We inadvertently had him in the lead. Forgot that Tracy had the three-second advantage. Now Raul, a couple of laps out of sequence, coming down pit road. We have him in sight now with the crew. We shoot from the front. We look from the back as he comes to a stop. Dick Simon's team that has stepped up so dramatically in the last couple of years. They've done a marvelous job with Bosell all season long. We don't see any changes up front. They clean out any debris from the radiators. They're ready. He's off the jacks. 15, 14.7 on that stop. And how does he come out? There comes Bobby Rahal and Robbie Gordon and Brian Till down the hill. They run seventh, eighth, and ninth. The front of the field, it is still Paul Tracy. You ride with Bobby Rahal, and Nigel Mansell is now running in second place, his teammate Mario behind him. We're almost at the halfway point of this race, 23 out of 50 laps done. The Bali pits on lap 24. It's a penalty. He's, he's got a stop and go penalty for exceeding his uh, speed limit on his original pit stop. So there you see him come in, stop. Give him a two count, and he's back out on the way. Making a long, hard weekend once again for Emerson Fittipaldi, who struggled so hard at Michigan to try and finish in the points, ended up 13th and just missed out. And he's desperately trying to chase Nigel Mansell in the championship battle, and now that speeding penalty is going to give him... Uh, the black flag for that is going to cost him some positions. He's going to have to work extra hard to try and get up there and get some more points in the PPG Cup. The penalty for Emerson Fittipaldi dropped him from fifth to eighth. Let's get an update from Gary. We understand from the Penske camp ball, it was 92 miles per hour on the violation on the entry into the pit. What the Penske people are unhappy about is that they came in with Ari Leyendijk. They said if Emma was going 92 and was right behind Ari, Ari had to be going too fast. No penalty for Leyendijk. We don't have any other word on that situation. It's dropped Emma back, I believe, to eighth. He lost three positions as a result of the stop and go. And of course, that has been much of the argument all along. They have three people reading the speeds up and down the pits. Now those three people then have to read on a track like this when virtually half the field comes in for pit stops all on the same lap. It's second a, place, Nigel Mansell. It's a difficult gray area to police that is controversial. However, the only reason they have it is for a safety reason. Remember what happened with Fittipaldi and Michael Andretti, a huge crash in the pit lane at Long Beach a couple of years ago. That's what they're trying to avoid. We're on board second place, Nigel Mansell, after 27 laps. The gap between Mansell and Paul Tracy is 14, almost 15 seconds. Mario Andretti's in third, five seconds behind his teammate. Oh, there you go, Leindijk spinning out, out of, I believe, turn five before Camel Hill. Oh, my. On the exit of turn five, that is, he looks like he got wide and looks like he made contact with someone else, too. What's Ray Hall here? That's a Chevrolet engine versus the Ford. Can he catch Matsushita on this front side? Oh, he gathers them up. Look at this. Look at it. Right under his rear wing. Whoosh. That's it. Bye-bye. I'm going. Substantial difference in power there. Leyendike continues to lead Ray Hall, though Leyendike in fifth place. Then Bobby Ray Hall in sixth. And here is Raul Boisel in seventh. 
No one chasing Bozell will continue to watch this telemetry feed from that car. 17 consecutive finishes in the points. Bozell had very reliable, phenomenal run until his crash last weekend, or the last race at New Hampshire. Here comes the carousel. This is where they were reporting rain. Oh, you can see it. See when the camera lens clears there, you can see this moisture. Not enough to really affect performance just yet. But under the possibility that there will be rain there, what are they doing up in the pits? Already they are beginning to think about the rain tires. They are stacked and ready to go, though the possibility of rain is here. The rain itself has not fully arrived. The leader is still Paul Tracy. So things are getting quite, quite interesting here at Road America when we've completed already 32 laps. And as we see our front runner, Paul Tracy, we were saying how Paul Tracy said earlier to us this weekend that he's won races this year when he's been feeling ill or hurt. And certainly he's hurt after that crash earlier Saturday. Has a very sore right foot. He's up in the lead. His lead right now is 14.21 seconds. But now we have a developing situation with the weather guy, and it also coincides with the window for fuel. Well, we're going to see the fuel stops in the next couple of laps. They're going to try and drag it out as long as they can so they can go the rest of the race without having to stop again. A lot of teams have been having fuel pickup problems over the weekend, getting the last couple of gallons out of the fuel cell, which a lot of teams have worked on overnight. And so they're going to really try and drag it out as long as they can before they make their next stop so they can go the last 17 laps without having to stop again. Obviously, they're not going to be backing off and slowing the pace down at this point. Obviously, a very good race going on. But the rain could play a factor if it does come down any heavier. Big, well-spread-out track. And the, as we have reports, it's raining in the carousel or a little moisture in the carousel, but only in the carousel, not raining here in the main paddock and pit area. Nigel is here, he stopped right on the marks. We check with the crew, they're not expecting to make any changes, just four tires and filling up with fuel. The four tires are on, they're waiting for the fuel. The fuel will come slower now, Paul, because there's not as much to push it into the car. They say, no, no, now you've got the fuel. He's underway, lights him up, and he'll be careful of the speed on the way out. Mario is pitted behind him, just finishing his service. 16.9 seconds for Nigel Mansell in and out. He has been very careful. You see the rest of the group coming in. Bobby Rahal came in a lap ahead of everyone else. And here as Mansell moves back up to speed, the rest of the field, Ari Leyendike and company are coming down again. But remember, they are running a lap out of, lead, out of sequence. And Raul Boisel is about eight laps out of the sequence. Now, the winner of this race may hinge on Paul Tracy's pit stop. We'll be able to follow it, but he needs to get in, get serviced, and get out quick enough to hang on to that lead. Mansell is hoping and gambling that he has problems. Paul Tracy came across the line with 20.2 seconds in terms of lead over Nigel Mansell at the last passing at the start-finish line. Timed by the EDS system. You know, they talk about these, these speed limits in the pits. They use radar guns. They have a truly sophisticated system in EDS. I don't know why they don't use it, Dirk. Well, anything that may get rid of a gray area, I'm all for. Gary Gerald waits for the arrival of the race leader, Paul Tracy been interesting to watch the other teams go by being cautious. Mansell went by us. It seemed like he was crawling to stay under that 80 mile per hour limit. It's all for safety. Car smoking on the front straightaway. Tracy comes into the pits now. A lot of brake dust as they pull the wheels off. That's not unexpected. Topping off with that precious fuel. Boy, has this young race driver matured. And I'm so impressed with his performance, even though he's not 100% today. Oh, the engine bobbles. Now it catches. A second or so lost, 15.6 in our clocks here, and a little slow on the get out. He lights the tires for a second, then watches his speed. Now we take a look at Mansell. Yeah, you see, he's not close enough. Oh, Tracy's almost off the racetrack. Look at this on cold tires, goes into turn one, way out of the racing groove, off into the gray area. But Mansell, we saw from that boxed picture, is the full length of the straight behind. But Guerrero's in trouble. As Tracy came out, you saw Roberto Guerrero there. Here comes Raul Boisel in as he comes back into the sequence of the pit stops. All of them refueling now for the end of the race. This stop coming on the 35th lap for Raul Boisel, 50 laps of scheduled distance. Tracy, apparently cautioned by those tires, were cold when he came out. They are not allowed to preheat the tires. 
Tracy is a no holes barred driver. Cold tires, warm tires, he gives everything. Look at the traffic jam here now into turn one. Ari Leyendijk, who went into the pits in second place, came roaring out, trying to get the best of Ray Hall and Gordon and the group coming around. We go back to the front of the field. Paul Tracy now up to full speed. He says he goes well when he's sick. Many of his good performances this year have come when he's either been off color or he's had an injury. So he said that may be a good omen for him this afternoon. Even though his neck muscles and his ankles were very sore, it's amazing when a driver gets in, he gets warmed up, and that adrenaline starts to rush around his body. Suddenly, you don't really feel the pain. Well, and Paul Tracy with a, an assignment that I'm sure suits him, as his job is to be the rabbit for Nigel Mansell. Now, if the championship were to end at this moment, well, this is the way it would end in terms of points. Of course, it's a long way to the end of the season yet, but Mansell's still holding his rather commanding lead in the points championship. So Robbie Gordon now has to chase again after that terrible first pit stop. He dropped all the way back to 14th position, climbed his way back to fourth. Now he loses that to Reha. Look, he's sideways again. Absolutely driving the wheels off this A.J. Foyt car. I think it probably just had to drive Gordon nuts to have a little accident like that. Look at the back of the car as it begins to show some vapor, either oil or down in that section. Could be something off the gearbox. And that could be the moisture that we saw on Ray Hall's camera lens. Very easily Instead of that. actually being rain, although it is very, very dark, looking out from our commentary box here. Bosell runs in seventh place as now he comes alongside Lion Dyke and takes sixth away from Lion Dyke. Robbie Gordon sits just ahead in fifth as Bosell now moving up through this field. Well, Robbie Gordon continues to stay on the race course and stay in the fight with Paul Tracy, the leader in 39 laps complete. Raul Boisel on a charge with Robbie Gordon. He's tried this a number of times in the past couple of laps. This time heading for the first turn, he moves to the inside. Gordon holds on, but Boisel has just enough room to get past. And Gordon and picked up the so position. Late there. Leader of the race, Paul Tracy. He comes up, threading his way through traffic, in this case, Hiro Matsushita. Paul Tracy is 18 seconds ahead of Nigel Mansell. The top of the order has not changed during the run of this race, save for the moments in and out of the pits. Tracy, Mansell, Andretti, the top three. All reports of rain have gone away from the race course for the moment, so any moisture it's going to come is going to come from the back of the 14 car. Ari Leyendijk set up looking for an opportunity. Of course, if there's no water at all in that engine, Ari Leyendijk could get a face full of engine all of a sudden as well. 42 laps complete, 50 laps of scheduled distance. Tracy still in front. Robbie Gordon finally makes it into the pits, Jan. He's Robbie Gordon is getting out of the car very quickly, Paul. Probably that means that he has a bit of that moisture that comes into the car. In other words, when they have an engine problem, especially a water-related problem, that hot water comes right into the car. You would almost swear this car is on fire. He just flew out of that car. What happens, Paul, it runs right down underneath the seat. Motor finally let go for Gordon. Not a happy guy, Robbie Gordon, who may have gotten a hot seat. This was Ari Leyendijk as he came past him, the ailing car at that time of Robbie Gordon. Robbie all the way off the race course, somewhat forced off. Fittipaldi comes around too, continues his pursuit of Leyendijk. And now he's sitting right at the rear wing of Leyendijk. And, and Robbie, this battle continues for sixth. Robbie Gordon was absolutely furious there with somebody or something. He took his gloves off, threw it at the scoring stand. He's absolutely furious. He fought so hard to get back to that fourth place. Now Lion Dyke has it, and Emerson wants it. I really don't know what's wrong. You know, the motor just finally started um, giving up because we had a good car. We were running fourth, and then um, we were pulling Ray Hall on the straights, and all of a sudden he started catching me a bunch on the straights. Back looking at third place now, Mario Andretti just coming around here, Matsushita, running alone on the course. Seven seconds, though, behind Mansell. So he is closing in on Mansell. Bobby Rahal is running in fourth place. He's a full 20 seconds back from Mario Andretti. So nothing changes at the top of the order. Paul Tracy is still the leader, followed by Mansell and his teammate Andretti. Mario Andretti slowing on the main stretch, continues past the pit exit, and now comes back up to speed. 
What's that all about? No, he's not up to speed. Oh, Buddy Lazier is off. He's on the dirt. Better bring half in it back onto the racetrack again. That's all. That's the last corner. But Mario is in trouble, and he has four long, slow miles before he can get back. Look at this. The invisible car is out. We have we have some rain. They said that there was a shower moving back into the area. So moisture coming back in, rain coming back in, and maybe it's just suddenly getting a little slick on all of them. Well, we've seen cars run out of fuel many times here, but I wouldn't speculate as to what that was. Yeah, that wouldn't Lots count for Lots of sudden Andretti. action. No, it wouldn't. So Mario Andretti gives up third place for the first time today as he slows on the main stretch. That brings Bobby Rahal up into third, followed by Raul Boisel. And they get together. Cheever and Goodyear in their fight get together. Well, 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 we did finally see another piece of contact. Cheever did make contact earlier, got away with it when he hit Guerrero, and that was the braking area for turn five, both cars fighting over the same piece of road, and Cheever comes off the worst. Oh, look at Goodyear, well, it's everything up. Oh, he's got a puncture. The left rear is punctured on Scott Goodyear's car. Cheever's going to drive by him. So when he got into Cheever's wing and took it off, it punctured the tire. Goodyear will have to nurse the car back to the pits. Cheever comes up alongside, gets the position as they bump. And but he both hit. cars are lame. Oh, look at this. Goodyear, well, he would be lucky to make it all the way back. Remind you of Damon Hill at the German Grand Prix when the tire shreds. He will be lucky to make it all the way back without doing too much damage to that car. A close competition for eighth place. And certainly Scott Goodyear will have to be somewhat aware of doing any further damage to the car and taking it totally out of the fight. Look Harris. at this. Look at this. They're on the grass. They're boxing. It's a boxing match. Now watch what happens here. Cheever tries to come down the inside. Oh, there's contact. Oh, one wheel. Then he takes the front wing off. And that's what punctured the left rear tire of Scott Goodyear. So both cars virtually out of contention because of that over-anxious or over-aggressive move by themselves, by all, by themselves. But going into five there, Scott Goodyear was having none of that bump and run tactic as he just slammed the door across the front of Cheever. Now Emerson Fittipaldi closing up on the back end of fifth place, Ari Leyendike. Fittipaldi looking for any point that he can garner toward a potential championship. 47 laps complete, three to go at Road America, 12 miles. Fittipaldi has won three times here in the past. The chances of him winning here are slim. The chances of him getting Leyendijk's fifth place are good. And Leyendijk knows that defensive driving may have to be employed here by Leyendijk to hold off Emerson Fittipaldi. It's the Ford engine down these long straights. Sometimes, what was that puff? A bit of display at the back. Whoa, Leyendijk's Leyendijk car is his tire, let's go. Tire puncture there for Leyendijk. As he came through the kink, good piece of handling to get that car under control at that point. But that gives the position away to Fittipaldi, just what he needed. Now Leyendijk nurses the car back to the pits. Well, that was obviously debris. We could speculate that was possibly debris on the racetrack that cut down Leyendijk's tire. We saw it as he went by our camera position. And on lap 46, we had seven cars in incidents just on that one lap between Robbie Gordon, Mike Groff, Buddy Lazier, Eddie Cheever, Mario Andretti, Scott Goodyear, and Ari Leyendijk, all on that one lap. So uh, we mentioned at the top of the show, very good racing here at Road America, and always some action towards the end. We had 10 or five leader changes at the uh, first race back in 19... 82 and 10 leader changes completely but now right in the middle of the field fourth fifth sixth seventh and eighth positions have all suddenly changed must be some debris out on the track and i'm sure that the newman haas team are on the radio to nigel telling him watch out keep your eyes and keep your eyes out for any stuff out on the track as we see the white flag being displayed for the last lap for our leader paul tracy indeed paul tracy with only 6.4 kilometers to go all he has to do is make it home safely the, his lead over Nigel Mansell is 19 seconds. Bobby Rahal is in third place. Would be a rostrum finish for him. What a glad, glad, glad tidings for Bobby Rahal. Raul Boisel is back in fourth place, and Fidi Baldi is in fifth. Let's go back to the conclusion of the race. With and Roger Penske looking for his third win here at Road America. With Derek Daly and Paul Page.
Paul Tracy has acknowledged the white flag at the start finish line indicating one more lap to go. Mario Andretti made it back into the pits. They're still working on his car. Ari Leyendijk made it back into the pits. They did replace that tire and he is back into the competition and Scott Goodyear also made it limping back into the pits as well. But we are on the final lap for Paul Tracy looking for his fourth win this season and a road course win once again. Nigel Mansell will continue in the points lead if they finish in this order, as one assumes they will. But Paul Tracy is certainly showing his power. And if he was sent out as the rabbit, he took it all the way to the checkered flag for Roger Penske. And he is the walking wounded. Walking, not when he's in the racing car. He's been on crutches since that terrible crash on Friday here. Somebody else is off the road big time. But Paul Tracy in the car doesn't seem to have too much trouble. No one in contest at the top of the order. Tracy followed by Mansell, followed by Ray Hall and Bozell. Fittipaldi picks up some good luck and moves into fifth place. He climbs the hill for the final time today in the Texaco Haviland 200. And Paul Tracy acknowledges the checker and takes the win. Watching for Nigel Mansell now. His wife happy with that one, of course. Here comes Mansell, final set of corners. Already he waves at the workers in one of the corner stations. Not in contest with anyone. He climbs the hill. The checkered flag waits for Nigel Mansell, who will continue his point lead by 31 PPG points over Emerson Fittipaldi. you could do about that race could I Penske was just fabulous he was flying we we worked pretty hard and tried to give him a hard time on the opening laps and then on the restart but then the first pit stop uh, he must have had a real good clean pit stop because I never saw him again it's a lonely race that one you know very happy that's how championships hopefully are won just by collecting points today second place for me is very valuable so this is how the championship standings look going into the last four races of the season. Nigel with a 31 point lead over Emerson, who's looked strangely out of sorts in recent races, but he can never be written off. Tracy up to within seven points of his teammate, and Raoul Bussell after that fourth place has rung up over 100 points. So Paul Tracy's day at Road America, but Nigel picking up valuable points for that second place. The Penske challenge is now being led by the young Canadian as we go into round 13 at Vancouver, British Columbia. It's a tight street circuit set in beautiful surroundings. Nigel versus the Penske's for the title. Join us then.